Hi, I'm Dan Earlywine from here in Athens, Ohio, and we are in my guitar shop. I'm a guitar fixer, sometimes guitar maker, and um, I've been in the guitar business since I was a teenager when I started taking guitars apart, painting them and doing things like that. And Except for playing in bands, which I did pretty seriously for a number of years from my teens until my late 20s. I was as serious about playing the guitar and being in a band as I was about working on them. But the working part took over and I so I have been fixing guitars and building some electric guitars since 1960. <laughs> Be about that. By 1960 I was doing it for my friends. And today we're going to go around my shop and see what I what little I have. And it's not that big, but there's a lot crammed into it. You're in the main room here, and this shop was only built five years ago. I used to be in the basement of the house next door. And we've been here in Athens, it'll be 35 years this fall. So we've been in this house 34 years. And at one point I had a shop, a basement built off the back of the house, but to get that, I had to have a deck on top for my wife, and which was fair, and I love it. We had a deck then. Five years ago, we couldn't find a place to expand to or move to, so we cut down a 220-year-old sycamore tree right here, and I have the wood even. It was a huge thing to do, and people took the stump out, and we built a shop here. Back to this end of the shop is, um, some of this stuff is temporary. I just bought this thing that's just sitting there. This little lathe I stuck away, but I was using it. It's supposed to be a wood shop, but back here I just bought this beautiful little old milling machine that's just the right size for a guitar shop. It's real quiet, and I got that from Don McCrosty, who I worked at Stumac with for years, and he's retired too. He makes the red diamond mandolins in shade. And he got a, another machine, and luckily I bought it. That's the back one to looking down Madison. So we're coming out. This was the end of my shop at that opening. So for three years, that was the entire shop. And then a year or so ago, we knocked out that wall and put an extension on it. If you could imagine, um, this giant workbench wasn't here then. But all these, ta all these tools were out here. And we had, at once we had three people. You, Paul, Steve and even Blake, right? Mm -hmm. At one time there were four young people working here in various capacities. One at one point was a paid student to be here because I would have students in and they would pay to learn what they wanted. Some were apprentices like Elise who works her butt off. She also uh, waits out at the Eclipse Company store. So she works uh, 11 hour days to be a guitar repair gal. Yeah, exactly. And these are some dirty benches I told you about. This stuff was all on these shelves. We are rearranging shelves. So uh, Elise and I are, all this mess is because we took it off these shelves to clean them and put our spray stuff on it. And all the sanding things here were on these shelves, so uh, Elise made shelves to hold them all. We're tightening that down so they won't shake. Right? Mm-hmm. Now we're going to tighten them down more. Show them what, your stuff. <laughs> She's been strapping them down so that the darn things won't shake. So this is where we keep little airbrushes, 
for spraying small guitar stuff, lacquers. What we have here is a newfangled device that's new in my shop for this last year. It's called the Howard's Total Vice. This man is approaching the guitar business with some stuff that he's designed for working on rifles, archery equipment, and in a machine shop, transmission shops. He's got all kinds of this hardware that's modular. So with this, the Howard's Total Vice, you can take your work away from the bench, walk all around it, and uh, this is the latest piece I've got. And Elise has been helping me. We're screwing big thick boards to these overhangs so they're strong and putting threaded inserts in there. And they can just drop that little red piece on these two thumb screws and have an instant place to put a vise. I'll show you another one later. Back here, um, it's not a lot of room. Come on back a bit. We're cleaning, like I say. We th threw a bunch, of, whole bunch of wood away. We didn't throw it away, gave it to a friend. There's storage up here, and that's almost full. A lot of these tools don't get used a lot, so they're on wheels. And uh, if I'm not using that, I can slide it back in the corner. Almost everything's on wheels. Not this, because it's too big and heavy. A couple of these aren't. But back in here you have a dust collector, a joiner, a disc sander, little planer, a tiny edge sander, those go up and down as they go, not plugged in, those go up and down while they're going around. A thickness sander, like if you had to sand a guitar top. This is a nice old Delta 6x48 sander. It's holding wood right now. That's some beautiful Spanish cedar. Here, if I lift this up, I have a little exhaust fan. If I'm sanding something heavy, I may have the dust collector on back here, but I still need more suction. So I'll have, I'll open this and sawdust will go out the window. Or I will do small spray jobs back here and I use a CO2 tank. That's for those airbrushes. It doesn't take a lot of air. It's quiet. I don't really spray big things out this fan. A lot of, a lot of rattle cans. And I put a filter up when I spray. That's the uh, the small shop spray booth for small items. You don't want to spray too much because you don't want to have it hanging in here while you breathe the fumes. I'll take, if I spray something and don't want the fumes, I'll take it over and hang it in the garage. That's Spider Wind. He was, Spider and me played in our first band coming out of high school called the Spiders. So that's Spider's drums, but he switched it to say Prime Movers because the Spiders had broken up. In the American blues, as it came into the electric era, which was quite long, some three famous King names would be B.B. King, Freddie King, and Albert King. And they're all great. Yeah. They're all different. Um, I would almost have to say that B.B. King might be the biggest influence on all young, younger blues players than himself that got famous. Yeah. Uh, and Albert would be a close second. 
and so is Freddie King. But they're all, Freddie King was a whole different kind of blues player. And I met Albert King at the 1969 Ann Arbor Blues Festival held in Ann Arbor where I lived and we played. And he had his original 1958 Flying V. And I asked him, if he, I said, man, I could make you a Flying V that's wood, it's the same color as your skin. This black walnut tree that I had. And he could tell I was respectful. And he came to my house and I drew that up and I made him that guitar. So that was, 19, he got it in 1972. <laughs> it could have been the 71 Blues Festival because Ann Arbor had three or four of those. This is one we took to a trade show a year ago. I just keep it around in case we need one to show. So it's really doesn't have a home, but I think we might get out and sell it one of these days. See, Albert played upside down, left-handed. I play the guitar this way. And he plays the guitar this way. So a guy could have a guitar that looked just like Albert King's, but be able to play it. Black walnut, maple, not too much lacquer. We wind our own pickups. That's popular these days. I mean, there's so many people that can wind a good pickup. I don't wind it, but one of the guys does. It was back 1970. My friend Mike Richards was a fellow musician and lived across the street back there and he was in art school at U of M and he designed the letters so they aren't any font. It just, we said let's get, what would look cool for Albert King? I think he cut those pearls out too. I can't remember that so long ago. Very nice. I wish I had a guitar that I have but it's down at Yorma Kalkinen's camp right now. I've fixed some guitars for some famous people, but the guitar, you said, have I fixed guitars for, some, I, did I fix some mighty famous guitars for famous people? Right, there you go. But almost a lot of the guitars you do in this business they're called vintage guitars, right? Vintage is a big word now that wasn't there when we were kids. It's vintage antiques or vintage this and that. It's worth more. It goes on. Um, what's that? Oh, the Rocho. Antique, Antique Rocho. Rocho. It's, they say it's a vintage class, neoclassical couch from so-and-so. So guitars are that way. This is what I mean by a vintage guitar. It's um, a 1955 Gibson ES-295, which is an archtop hollow body built sort of like the ES-175 with a Florentine cutaway, painted all gold, gold silk string on the pick guard, and it sounds killer. And this man is a good player and he's had it for quite a while and he sent it in for new frets, made a new nut and fit a new bridge on it because somewhere along the line it had lost its original bridge and had kind of a imported no good bridge on it. So we fixed them up and UPS dropped the box and there's a small lawsuit now but they're settling it. They must have dropped it 10 feet because we can pack and it bashed the end in. There's the, re there's the repair job. I've got to look at it this weekend. Bam. So he sent it back. It's not my fault because it was bubble wrapped and it split off the end block here and it split here. And that's going to be a tricky fix. It's not something that we rush into. You think about it for a while. I can get some access to the inside through the pickups if I take them out. It's just such a lot of work. 
for rough handling is what I would say. So this is pop loose. It's not, you don't just squirt glue in there. You've got to really think it out and have clamps so when everything goes back, it's right. It's a good thing that it's so beat up like this because it would be sort of easy to hide the work a little bit with some of this gold paint, which we can get our hands on. Turns green with age. You see that as it gets down into the bronze powder. That's what this is, gold bronzing powder. Like gold leaf in a way, I guess, but it's not real gold. That's what I mean by vintage. Okay, what else would what, be what's interesting? What's the story with the crane guitar here? Anything special? This here? Yeah. Well, this is um, it's a strat, it's a strat shaped body, and it's uh, actually these bodies were made by Fender or by a company for Fender. For I, the very early 60s, it was some one of the Harley Davidson anniversaries. So this has the same um, buffed aluminum pick guard. And I came by a couple of these bodies from a friend that never got finished. No necks, but it's a bolt on. And I decided to make a guitar out of it because of, I had one once. I did ha I, when this came out way back then, I had gotten my hands on one of these because then a friend of mine from town here is not here anymore, did the engraving for the Harley Davidson Strat. Ron Chasey had the, uh, he engraved the pick guards and all that. And this one was, uh, had somehow been a reject or I think it was for him to practice on, but he didn't need any practice. So I got the body, I got a few of them and I put very expensive tuners on it. I'm gonna make a guitar. This is gonna be called a Strational. Do you know the National? The yeah. National guitar, the electric ones, the metal ones? This is a Strational. What are you gonna load it with? That's what I, I'm thinking. I'm gonna call all, all my friends who are some of the best uh, pickup makers in the world. I've just happened to be lucky enough to grow up in the same era as Seymour Duncan and Lindy Fralin and all of these, Jason Lawler, and the list goes on of pickup makers. What would you put into a strash? I'll, I'll send them a picture and say, what pickup do you think would sound best on a metal, on an aluminum plate in this body? What's going to really, and they're going to make some pickups that'll be just what they think, and I'll be happy. But this has been sitting here like this for a year now. I got as far as, got some uh, stainless steel up on the peg head. Got a sheet of it and cut it up. I haven't gotten back to it, but it's gonna be cool. It's got some very special ambrosia maple from, I got from the Amish out in Chester Hill. There's no lacquer on it. It's gotta get sanded and fretted. Hmm. Either made you happy or sad. I've, I've cut something, something that. that's challenging and unique. Is the reason I think that guys like, or girls, people like us, go into this business because we like to fix things. I like to fix things. It's I like challenges. I like a a problem to solve with what I know, which is basic woodworking, metalworking a bit, and a bit about plastics and materials and the tools to work them. That's what fascinates me. I like creating things, making things. I know you've made a, designed a number of tools. I've come up with a lot of tools over the years. Uh, oh, one would be, I'll be right back. I'd say uh, this old tool that I 
came up with for Stu Mac, the Jaws fret press. I've always been really proud of this. This comes down on top of the neck and you squeeze the frets in, like you had an arbor press. Right. People in production use an arbor press often. This did it while the guitar neck was on and it's become real popular. Things like that and a lot of things I co-designed with Don McCrosty and Todd Sams. One day I said that Don McCrosty, we used to have the Stumac R&D shop and the factory out on Banjo Hill, which is out towards Shade. You go out Old 33 and you take a right at the big tree. In fact, the, the road is called, uh, uh, it might be called Stuart McDonald Road, something like that. They had it changed, I think. That's where the Stumac factory was. Is it still there, the building? That's still there, but we moved out of there and finally moved into the new building. Stuart has stuff stored in the property and he comes back. But I'm sitting there one day with Don in his office out there. We'd all go out there a lot. I said, man, I wish I had a ruler that could just read the fretboard and tell me if it's flat or not and not hit the frets. And like three days later, he comes up with a tool like this. It wasn't as, as pretty as this, but he made one and set it on my desk. And that sits right over. This is a nice neck on this old K. That tells me that the neck itself is pretty good. Otherwise, you have to rely on your eye. Tools like that. And, oh, I could show you a lot of tools that I'm proud of. Or just tools in general that we make at Stumac. I'm retired now, but that things that we've come up with in the 30 four years I was there have become used all over the world. So I'm proud to have been part of that. And those tools are still available? These oh, Stumac? Sure. Oh yeah, you go to the Stumac. The Stumac website now has more stuff than ever because they've grown. They've spent money fixing the building, hiring more people, getting on the internet, going out after, I would say, younger people, new people, to keep this whole trade and building alive. And that's one thing, if you ask me something that wasn't difficult that I'm really proud of is that I have helped people to learn since the beginning. I've always enjoyed showing what I knew. And if somebody had a question, I'd stop and actually show them. And then realize, gosh, I could, uh, train this person, then I'd have some help, so. Hello, I'm Elise Couts. I am one of Dan's apprentices. Um, been here for about... Four years? This will be my fourth year, so still going strong. And yeah, I learned a lot, we get a lot done, so it's going good. She graduated from OU? Mm-hmm. Yep. Works, she's a hard-working girl. Mm-hmm. She worked 11 hours the day before yesterday. Yeah, I was very tired yesterday. She gets here at nine in the morning, goes out and works at a great restaurant outside of town and worked till 11. So that's... Long days, but it'll but pay off. Over you have to, if you want to get good at this trade, you have to just keep doing it, and a lot. Mm -hmm. That's why you better get home tonight after work and Practice dressing frets. All right. Okay. So this is uh, a 1937 Gibson made Kalamazoo. They're ladder braced budget brand. This would be considered, a, but it's made all of the same woods and it's just not X braced and fancy braced. It has one simple piece of binding And it has the same neck that you would have found on a J45, which wasn't even made yet. 
on a J35, then later a J50. All the Gibson necks of the 30s have the kind of a V. And it's, I just love it because I found out after 60 years of playing a guitar that I'm a small guy playing, I've always had the big guitars, the D28, I had a J200. And now at 76 years old, this shoulder I know has been pushed out of shape from sitting like this, doing one of the most enjoyable things I like to do. Let's play the guitar. So I've taken to this guitar and they've made it like this one where I've, I've installed through uh, threaded inserts down the center of the neck up to here and I screw my capos down to it. I don't like a capo that clamps. It's in my way. I can't execute. Some people can and I've used capos since 1960. I don't have capos on this. The one they're making, the DE11, because this is called a KG11, so they make the neck about an inch and a quarter longer before it turns into a peg head. That's because I don't like hitting the peg head, just like I don't like hitting the capo. So the DE11 has an elongated neck. It just keeps going with a little extra after the nut. And I find that now I can play a B7 chord or certain eight E chords really comfortably without hitting this whole corner. So it's a... Uh, it's a sweet Gibson East dulcet tone. I'll show you the capos on this my other guitar, which I love too, but it's big guitar. The last guitar I loved before my little Kalamazoo would have been this one. And I still get it out because I love the sound of it. I, I often stay capoed up. See, the capo only covers four strings. The other two, if I, if I put this capo at the second fret, it would be holding down an A chord. Here I have capoed up to the fourth fret, but I put a real capo here. That's a whole step below it. It's holding down two strings, the outside two E's. So that means that I have this sound, an octave. Like detuning. But the rest have never been changed. So I could I could still play a G chord, G position, and have this. You don't have that. When you drop D you lower it to a whole nother note, which doesn't work. So I can get... good for blues. It's kind of like a G tuning. There's a bar G chord. That's the same for that. Because I've closed those open strings. But here I get
that's what the capos do. That's a 1939 or 40 J35 that's been, somebody put a brush coat of household varnish on it probably a long time ago. It was on there when I bought it. They sanded on it and then varnished it. They sand, probably sanded off the lacquer. And I started, I sanded this out to smooth it. And I was thinking of trying to polish it out. At one point I had a piece of tape on it. And when I pulled the tape, it started pulling off the finish. So I thought, oh no. And I, I put a little lacquer thinner on it and rubbed it down and let it sit. And said, I'm not messing with it because I like the sound. They also took off the name Gibson. They stripped that. They did a refinish job on it. So that would kill the value of this as a vintage guitar, but a player might buy it because it's killer. So we made a silk screen and sprayed Gibson back on it. I also have screw-on capos that just screw right on it. They're over in a bowl. But this gives me the freedom of playing that I really like. That's a... Uh, I'd be hitting the peghead right now on any other guitar, and I'd play a lot of plain blues and old country music. I mean, if you like that kind of old harmonious, melodic, semi-modal folk music. It's not an open tuning. It's just two drop D strings, which puts you almost in a drop D chord because you've got D, A, D, and sort of in a drop G chord, which is a Gibson master tone banjo tuning. So I can get banjo licks on it. I'm looking for something that should be right out in front of me. Yeah, this is a. Uh, these are the little capos. These are in progress. I make them out of a. Uh, you know, a Gibson Tunematic bridge on a Gibson gu electric guitar. Yeah. They are. Uh, this kind of bridge. The old tunematic on your Les Paul 335. I make these out of the little thumb screws that hold those on the guitar. They're threaded studs and a round plated thumb wheel. Remember those? Yeah. I so I just silver solder those together and then I put them in a little lathe and machine off the solder. and face them off and I put a little piece of Brazilian rosewood on this one. Sometimes it's pearl dots. Make them decorative. I put a lot of men's cufflinks. These are in there because they're about to be cut off. They got to be a certain length. So with this little piece I thread it in as deep as I want and I cut it right off on the bandsaw and it's perfect length and I'm sending them to a guy that bought the DE-11 wants more of these screws. Let's see if this will go on. I can put a thumb wheel on this too. I found I liked screwing them down because I'm not entertaining. I wouldn't go along without making another tool if I can't find it, but I think in cleaning up, we're going to find it all. I have so many capos. 
So that would be now I've I'm capoed up whole step. Just like a regular guitar with the capo. And even that is less I haven't shaped this either. I still square edge. I shape them so I just wanna I wanna play over that. I might want to play an A minor chord like that, not like this. Or maybe my hand's getting tired playing in a knee position. I'll just go in here. Then I've, since I like to play with doubles because I like my drop Ds, if I was playing fancy jazz songs, I don't know. There's, I don't think there's any song I couldn't play. I'd have to rethink certain chords. If I was doing Beatle chords I and mean Beatle songs, a lot of songs aren't easy to get with two drop Ds. You have to have a different inversion, if that makes. So now i got two capos on in my little favorite guitar. I don't expect that you'll show all this on a television show. It would drive me crazy. <laughs> That just makes this guitar resonant. I can feel it. So I have I wish I had, uh, could go further. It's good for old country stuff or blues. Here's a nice one. That's not done, but that's that's women. I've already used that a lot. It's all creased from the strings. Because I lost one or gave one away. And I make it real quick on the aluminum part and this it's the making this small and sanding, that's all handwork. It's really hard to do it on a machine without wrecking it. Put it on a little stand and I use a hand files and radius off. That'll be, I'm going to put that in my pocket <laughs> so I remember to finish it. We're down in the basement and my wife and a friend of ours who was a, sort of an architecture type and studied uh, modeling, home modeling and uh, design, they designed the size of this building so that Ron Curtis could build it. That's a local builder in town that does great work. So it holds a uh, pickup truck, two fairly big sized milling machines. That's the kind of thing you don't want to move around a lot. And a little lathe, my metal tools. There's a little power hacksaw. I can store some boxes underneath these stairs coming down. And uh, it's way more room than I had next door in that in the old garage of the house. And in here I have 
this is a, a small efficiency apartment that I have students that come sometimes and stay for a couple weeks and I train them. Wow. And we stayed in a Sausalito across the bridge from San Francisco in the that's where the heliport was. They had helicopter airport. Yeah. And the rock and rollers, you know, uh, Electric Flag, Mike Bloomfield's band, that was their practice room in a heliport. Quicksilver Messenger Service, um, another San Francisco acid band, I can't remember. We were sleeping on the floor and playing these crappy little joints. And Bloomfield came in one morning and says, you guys are taking our place at the Fillmore tonight. And... Uh, to open for Eric Clapton in the Cream, and I'd heard I've heard of Clapton because of the Yardbirds, and that was I think before the uh, John Mayall and the Blues Breakers that made Eric Clapton famous uh, to me then. But before that, I think it was Yardbirds, and uh, we opened for the Cream. We we did what he told us. We were kind of nervous. We went down there at 4 o'clock in the afternoon to check in, drive across the Golden Gate Bridge, or one of those bridges. It wasn't the Golden Gate, it was another bridge. And Bill Graham, he ran the Fillmore West. He's at the stage doors. We're bringing in our little Fender amps, and he goes, you don't need any amps. We got amps. And he pointed up the stairs to the stage, and there was like a stack of marshals. That's Clapton and a stack of Fender Twins, and they're all piggybacked together, you know. And uh, my brother Michael, the, the boss of the band, he says, uh, no way, man, if we don't have our own amps, we're not playing. So we set up in front of all those amps, four people with these, I had a little Fender Deluxe. Eileen, our bass player, Eileen Silverman, she had an Ampeg B18. You know that one? Yeah. The piggyback that you open up? Mm -hmm. And uh, when the curtains opened, the curtains opened and it's a ballroom and they had a fishnet all across the ceiling full of, must have been a thousand balloons. So when they opened the curtains, they pull a cord and there's a 800 hippies out there and all these balloons falling down and hitting us on the head. It just felt like surreal. And then we had to start playing in the midst of all that. That's my uh, only time I ever played at a place that big. Yep, some real good, great ones. Don McCrosty, Philly Jones, Billy Reinhardt.